Coming, we got um, Raikou Light. Yep, all the light. You just started your own house. I did. That's what's up. That's what's up. So, uh, tell the people a little bit about yourself. Like, when did you get started in ballroom? When? Uh, how did you first find out about ballroom? Um, I first started. I first found out about ballroom by going to a party, and at that party, it was. People falling on the floor and getting back up again. And I was like, oh, I want to do that. It looked fun. And then I kept going to the club and I saw people doing it. This is before the YouTube era. It's like 2005. So I had to actually ask somebody, could they train me? And that led me into the House of Quran in 2006. That's dope. So what was the first ball you ever walked? My first ball was uh, the Prodigy Ball. In Philadelphia, Murder by Numbers. I walked Virgin Vogue. Okay. That was 2005. Okay, and, um, like, what was the f what was first house you said you was in? The House of Quran. The House of Quran. And what uh, inspired you to join that house out of all other houses? I mean, honestly, they were, like, a, the fab house at the time. And especially in the Baltimore and Philadelphia area. Right. And this is back when the Qurans and the La Croix, before the La Croix, so it was just like the it house for me. And I just loved the performance in the house. And then the same person that brought me into the house also went to my university. And he was a dance major. So I was a dance major. He was a dance major. He taught me how to Vogue. I was learning how to do ballet at the, in the daytime, learning how to Vogue at night, going up and down the coast for balls. So yeah. Okay, so like who were some of the people that like first inspired you to start like Vogue? Um, Inspire me, let's see, I would say, of course, Prince, because um, I'm one of the older girls. So, like, the Vogue Femme Divas of that era was, like, Ricky, Pretty, um, Kitty. Okay, so that's what's up. So, like, um... You went to Quran, then what was, what was your next house after that? Um, so, Quran closed when John Quran passed away. And at the time, I was living with my mother, iconic Lisa Revlon. Um, shout out to Lisa Revlon, love her. Um, so, she, she actually, um, the story behind me becoming a Revlon was, I actually was homeless and she came and she like said you can move in with me you don't have to worry about rent or nothing just go to school do what you have to do and just live your life and i will like always be indebted to her because literally i was also going through my mother passing away at the same time as becoming homeless so it was a lot to deal with yeah that was um <clears throat> a lot did you find food in barbara like yeah because i felt like for me, ballroom, it wasn't about a physical house, but it was about a physical house because I was living with my mother, right. my gay mother. 
So it was like, we were always around each other. We would go like day to day functions. We were always together. So when we came to a ball, it was like the icing on the cake. It was like, okay, go ahead, have fun, cut up. And, you know, do what, just have fun. And it was like, that was the main point of ballroom at that point. It was just to go and have fun before like the grandiose cash prizes. Right. So what, um, what is your motivation in ballroom? My motive. It's just the name. Fuck everything else. Like it's about coming out and proving to yourself that you have the balls to go out there to Vogue for me because I'm a between Vogue fam to go out there in your outfit and whatever and, and sell it in like in love and love yourself for doing it and love the audience, love the judges and like really um, go off. So, so what um, like what is Butch Queen Vogue film to you? Like what what do you like if you was just explain it to somebody that has never heard about ballroom and they were just to ask you like explain that category to me. What would you say to them? I would say Between Vogue Femme is magical because you take somebody who's been oppressed, who's in their day-to-day -day life, I'm going to speak from my personal experience, in their day-to-day -day life being criticized, being bullied, and you find some place where you can go and express those feelings and in an art form of dance. So... Between Vogue Femme is expressing the feminine side of yourself. Also, voguing like a femme queen, we all know that, but expressing your deep longing for the feminine energy and to be okay with it and be at peace with it. So, how do you see that opposed to like old way? What is the differences? I feel like the differences are. I it's not a lot, honestly. It's not really that many differences because you still have to have precision. You still have to be clean. You still have to be, I would say, the cunt side of it, the, f the breaking of the wrist, the rolling, the tapping. That's what makes between Vogue Femme, Vogue Femme. Because you have to think about it. It is like a femme queen's body. They got the work done. They got the boobs done. So you have to move your body like them. So you got the big hips, the big ass, the big titties. And you're not trying to mess up your work when you did. Like, honestly. So, who are some people who you would consider to be, like, um, like a peer? Maybe not people that, like, came before you, but people that came after you or came, you know, during your same time. Who are some of your peers that you would have to, like, kind of, like, you know, give it up to to just to say like they inspired you in some way to maybe like get out there or. Um, I would say Rocky Garçon because he came out like right after me, but he, we were always in the same batch in Baltimore in DC, and then I would say Aniche, my best friend, evoked. We would be at the same balls, in the same line, and didn't even know each other. I didn't meet him until I moved out here to LA. So we would be at, at Philadelphia Awards Ball or DC Capital Awards Ball and be like in the same line, ready to Vogue and didn't even know each other. And then we become best friends at when I like 10 years later. What is the best part about ballroom like that you have that you would say that it like made your life better? Um, the artistic expression, honestly. And then like I know for ballroom, for me, like even with the reason why I started the House of Light, 
was because I felt there is a need in the community where we have this thing where we shame everybody for doing stuff that they, you know, that people do. And they're really hurting, like with the crystal meth, because I used to be an uh, addict. And it's something that I deal with. Even creating my house is something that I focus on, is to cut the shaming. Like, because a lot of the girls are suffering, and I feel like mm -hmm. even if you wanted to stop doing it, you can't. Because it's like, you don't have nowhere to turn to. And especially if, if you don't have your parents, or if you're deceased, I mean, like if your parents are deceased, it's like, it's really hard to come, come to grips like, oh, I have a problem. Even if you come to grips with what you have a problem, you don't know how to get services or reach out to somebody that's in the ballroom scene who's supposed to be your parent and say, hey, I have this problem because you don't want nobody to read you, which they tend to do. I understand that. Uh, okay, so for me personally, um, you know, I'm not no saint. I've, I've never tried crystal meth before, but I have tried like ecstasy. Right. So I don't judge people. However, like my friends that, my old friends mm -hmm. that um, started doing meth, like I kind of had to like kind of leave them alone because it seemed like they turned into a different person almost. So. Yep, I would I would say that. So what what would you say to somebody? Because you, you, you just said you don't want people to judge, but it's like when some of the actions that they do, display, right? some of the actions that they display, requires them to be judged how do you um not only deal with somebody in your life whether it be a friend or family member that has an addiction but how do you you know like you said not judge them how do you give them love guidance even though you don't agree with what they're doing i would say just treat the person not the not the addiction or the drug just checking in on them asking them if they're okay or how they're doing just would like there's somebody that cares about them because I know for myself it came to a point where I was hiding what I was doing so I didn't want people to know but nobody checked in on me so it was like oh well girl pay it yeah so just basically letting them know that you're there okay absolutely okay so how is is like is meth a big problem here in LA, big problem here in LA. It's a pan. It's like literally a, epi a pandemic, okay. like everywhere, yeah. and people are getting taken out by fentanyl. Like the girls are getting taken out left and right. Yeah, I literally had two friends that passed away like last month. Wow. So why, if people know that it's being like cut and stuff like that, what is like why do I don't? I just don't understand like why people are still doing it and. If you know somebody got some like a bad batch or something, why? Because sometimes you don't know the person has the bad batch. You you get the you're the first person that does the batch, and you're like, oh, next. Like, you know what I mean? That, why don't people kind of like come down on a person that is selling it the bad batch? You know what I'm saying? Because it's almost like you almost like out here killing people just for a quick, but to a certain extent. Okay, so I understand what you're saying but it's not that simple especially when when you're selling multiple drugs or you're selling stuff that you're getting from your supplier and somebody overdoses it's like i never wanted that happen to me because i did used to back in the day i used to um sell but i would always make sure like the stuff didn't have cut in it or anything like that but you just never know because everybody is trying to get a buck. So it's like really hard to like specify that because when you don't have a job and you're hustling out in the streets, your that quick buck will feed, get get you some food or get you a, a hotel room for the night. Right, so how do we like, how do we even like deal with the, with the, uh, drug crisis you know how do we uh support each other um besides just letting each other know that we there because like you said people are dying yeah so i think draw more attention to it even with my story i have 
That's like kind of like the house's mission and campaign. And it's also to get a 501c3 so that we can have like a crisis center so people know that they can come and get services. Right. So the House of Light was really created to uh, serve the community. Absolutely. I mean, even with my production company, RYB Productions Incorporated, um, it was to serve the community. I saw a need and I wanted to fill it. There was nobody documenting our balls out here in the West Coast. My moments were missed. Sometimes I would crawl from out of God knows where and make a, make everybody be like, oh, my God. Nobody got it. Nobody had live back then. So it's just like I saw the need and I was like, I'm going to pick up a camera. I'm going to learn how to use it. And I use it. Right. Much like yourself. Right. And I applaud you for that. Yeah, me too. Um, definitely <laughs> one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you because, like you said, it, it definitely is a need um, for the preservation of our culture. history and yep. culture. We're, we're, get, we're curators, yeah. essentially. Yeah, most definitely. Um, pretty much everybody in the scene. And anytime you have a ball, a function, and there's nobody recording, I feel like it's just a missed opportunity. Um, and like, like, like I said, it's history, so we definitely have to do that. Uh, where do you see uh, RYB Productions going in the next like five to ten years. Oh, five to ten years, we're gonna be having my own studio, having that as a uh, rent space for people and photographers all over to come, rent out the studio, do their pictures, do their videos. And I really see it manifesting into something greater, especially with the House of Light. It's like a dual system. I have my, I have RYB Productions, which is older. House of Light, I started in 2020 during the pandemic so i feel like they're going to support each other in the same mission to serve our community right that's what's up um i really appreciate that because i think that a lot of people in our community are broken a lot of people in our community do need uh love and you know support so i i, I wish you much success on that um what would you say to somebody who's watching this um, who may know somebody or somebody that may actually themselves have like a drug problem? What would you say to them to get themselves or that person help? Um, Beyond just, you know, saying I'm gonna be there for you. I would say this, I say, I would say I didn't want to stop doing drugs until I wanted to stop doing drugs. There's going to come a point in the time in the person's life, hopefully they make it to that point, where you're going to get tired of the same bullshit. You're going to get tired of the same different hotel rooms. You're going to get tired of sleeping out on the street or on the train or at your girlfriend's house or getting the date off of Adam for Adam or jacked just so that you have a place to go. You want to get tired of that. It's going to be the same story, different cast. You know what I mean? So until so the person is tired or like something traumatic happens to jolt them out of it, you're really going to have to just pray and then check on them because just checking on them gives them morale, it boosts up their morale. And that goes a long way to know that somebody cares about you. And a lot of times being gay or LGBTQ, you could, you feel not seen. And if you feel not seen, it actually makes you depressed, which lowers your immune system, which it does a, a number of things. So it's like just checking in on somebody and praying for them. And now if it's the person, you're not going to stop until you want to stop, until you get tired. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, like I said, thank you for um, coming, sharing your story, your insight. Um, is there anything you would like to let the people know about, like anything you got going on, anything you want to highlight? Um, just go to my new YouTube channel. They took my YouTube channel down. They took it down because of Sex Siren from Marcus Tichy's Ball. And I didn't check the clip. I was trying to get everybody's clips up. And I didn't check it. So they took it down because of the nudity. And they just, like, deleted my whole entire page. Four years of work. Four years of my work of West Coast Ballroom history. Not gone because I still have the SD cards. 
but now I'm trying to re-upload it to my new page, which is under the same uh, title, R-Y-B Productions. R-Y-B Productions. Yeah, that's what's up. Um, every, definitely everybody go follow that. Um, what, oh, my last question, uh, describe yourself in five words or less. Five words or less, loyal, spiritual, honest, charismatic, superhero. Ladies and gentlemen, Raikou Light. <laughs>